This conference is now being recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to the New York State ASBO webinar, Social Networking and its Impact on the Business Office. My name is Matthew Darius. I am the Senior Staff Associate for Professional Development here at ASBO, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Your speakers for today's program are Chris Brown, Michael Vespi, and Nancy Cole. Operator assistance is available anytime during this conference by pressing zero pound. Questions for the speakers may be asked anytime by pressing seven pound on your phone. You may send chat questions anytime by using the chat window to the right of the main screen. I will now turn the call over to our speakers. Chris, please begin. Well, good afternoon, Deirdre and Wendy. And anybody else who's out there listening today, want to uh, just welcome you to this webinar. And hopefully by the end of this, um, you'll have a better understanding of how we use current social media tools to more effectively do our jobs. And uh, I've had the unique opportunity to have worked in several different situations, and I'll talk about those uh, throughout the course of this webinar, just to kind of give you an understanding of, of how you can use social media in a lot of different situations to, to control the message, to present the message, and hopefully wind up with uh, informed taxpayers and also I'm going to show you some ways as well to make uh, the business office even a little more efficient by using social media. So I thought what I would do is kind of talk about me a little bit. You know, I've attended a lot of different webinars and things. I know you don't want to hear too much, but I think it's, it's good for you to know kind of what my background is uh, before we get started. And then we're going to talk about communication, which is really the, the key to everything, whether it's uh, community relations or communication with your staff or whoever it might be, and then how to be proactive. Then I'm going to show you this thing called the quality triangle, which I, I think will kind of give you an idea of why we can do, do things sometimes and why we can't, and how certain things that we do wind up being successful and, and how some of them don't. And then we'll talk about overall communication flow, and we'll specifically then start talking about Twitter and social networking, and then we'll kind of wrap things up, and I'll I'll take any questions, and in fact, if, if you have questions throughout the presentation today, just feel free to ask. So to get started, um, I wanted to show you that I've kind of done almost every trade that you can do in education. I, I included some of the major highlights, uh, being a teacher aide in the Buffalo City School District and uh, also having been a teacher in the alternative education program kind of... Uh, open my eyes to communicating with both students and parents who may be difficult to communicate at times. This is well before, obviously, social media. And then heading on and becoming a math and computer science teacher for a bunch of years at a school called Hammondsport Central, which when I started there as a teacher had about 1,000 students, but due to decline in the uh, economy there a few years back when I left there as superintendent, they had just over 500 students, so a tremendous drop. But uh, Hammondsport was also the place where I was able to become a technology coordinator, uh, school business official, and then as I achieved and got my uh, administrative certificate, uh, the school business administrator, and then the assistant superintendent for general administration, and then lastly, superintendent of, of schools. Uh, the thing about a small school that I think is very, very useful for, for at least me to understand and others is a lot of times you have to know how to do everything in a school district. So so as you progress on to being a superintendent, you understand what everybody else has to do in their jobs. So in my current role as a superintendent of the West Genesee School District today, I do work very, very closely with my assistant superintendent for finance, uh, Paul Pelton, and I do know where he's coming from. I do know how the business office functions because I, I ran the business office for several years. So when I talk about different initiatives or regulations or philosophies and all that, it is coming from the background of having been a school business official and administrator um, in the past. And then I also think the next piece, too, that I've gotten a lot of education from was getting a doctorate of philosophy uh, not in education. And while I was criticized at the time, um, I think in today's economic uh, situation, having a doctorate in business administration and project management I think right now has been a little more worthwhile for me than had I gotten it in education. Um, I also like to try to stay as sharp as I can because as superintendent, I don't have my hands in things financially all the time like I used to. So I, I enjoy my time as, as an adjunct professor at uh, LeMoyne, and I teach a lot of their business and uh, educational administration 
courses and that I'm always trying to see what the next thing is that's out there. So I've hooked up with a company called Gerson Lehrman Group, and I do a lot of uh, international consulting about education, about finance, about investments, uh, things like that. So a lot of times I'll talk with people in Europe or other places about initiatives that haven't, haven't even gotten to the United States yet, and I'll have a leg up on knowing how maybe a state budget might work or pitfalls that they're running into or things like that. So that's kind of, a again, a very brief um, about me. Now let's talk about our webinar. And really, there are a few goals about communicating. You want to try to reach as many people as possible. One of the things that, that uh, I've found over the years is we all know the message. So when we're out there talking with people, whether it's at a diner or you're at the grocery store or wherever, we are talking to people as if they've known what we've known for as long as we've known it. And more times than not, you see a blank look on someone's face, and you walk away from that conversation saying, man, I thought I communicated with everybody, but, but apparently I didn't. So what we want to do as part of our communication goals, we want to be able to reach as many people as possible. And then secondly, and I think very, very importantly, is being able to control the message. Um, you know, I, I'm probably a control freak by trade, but uh, I think being able to have the facts out in the community so that people can argue the facts instead of creating rumors and all that is the way to do it. And the only way to do that is to be able to control the message and keep getting the, the correct information out there. And part of controlling the message also allows you to stay ahead of the media and it allows you to stay ahead of the grapevine. And when I was a, a younger superintendent and even into my business official years. Um, I've been a superintendent for 11 years now. Um, as a business official, it would always amaze me when the newspapers would call and they would foil lots of information. And I could never figure out, as a business official, you know, why are they foiling this type of information? I, I couldn't get it. You know, salaries of people, contracts, stuff like that. Well, uh, what I found out was because the message about certain district issues, they weren't being controlled properly as the media was hearing about things from individual staff members or other community members, the media was kind of digging in and really getting a leg up on, on how things were running. So, so I tucked that in the back of my mind and said, you know, when I'm in a position to, to control the message from the top level, i got to make sure that I'm, I stay ahead of the media. And that really has had some success. And I think the thing, too, that, that a lot of people uh, don't do well, I think a lot of people are afraid to seek and then get feedback. And in this job whether you're a business official or a superintendent, you've got to have broad shoulders and you have to have a thick skin. And I've, over the course of my career, I've seen too many people fail because they can't handle it when somebody gives them maybe some feedback that criticizes a decision or a philosophy. But what you really have to do in your communication strategy for yourself is be willing to seek feedback out. So for example, uh, I'll use extracurricular funds as an example because in the business official world, um, we, we know that a lot of our extracurricular activity coordinators you know, don't hand in their letters on time but still want to get paid and all that kind of thing. And seeking out guidance from them to find out you know, what's the best way for me to get this information from you and listening is okay. And the feedback that I used to get would be, you know, we have enough to do. We don't need to be able to hand in, we don't have to hand in these ledgers and this and other thing. And I would always say, well, look, at, you're being paid to hand in the ledgers and you're being paid to handle this extracurricular activity. But now let's figure out a way that makes it easiest on you. And just getting that feedback back and forth is good. And then lastly, a communication goal would be to have ownership. And one of the things that I guess I'll highlight here would be the, the communication piece of having everyone included and really having a family or team concept. Um, I happen to be in a school district where all of our employees have taken a wage freeze for next year. And to my knowledge, I, I believe we're still the only school in New York State that's had that. And the question that I got from a bus driver just the other day was they asked me why other schools who maybe have some of their staff freezing, freezing wages, why they're not asking their bus drivers because um, you know they all count. And what the bus drivers are hearing from other school bus drivers is that they're not being asked because they, don't, they won't save the district enough money. And there was an interesting conversation about communication. I, I think that when an entire community gets the word out that all of their employees have taken a wage freeze, then when you're trying to pass a budget or talk about some difficult things within a budget, everybody knows that everyone in your organization has kind of taken one for the team. And 
as I'm reading the newspapers now and, and things like that, I am seeing the effects of not having every employee on board with some of these uh, wage freeze activities. There's a communication piece where I actually received some feedback from a bus driver, as an example, and realized that that stakeholder ownership is, is very, very critical. Now here are some different ways to communicate. Now if I put myself in, in the role of a business official or a business administrator, we, you know, I, I would say to you that probably when I was in that role, most of my communication came from face-to-face -face conversations with people or through email or through phone calls, I would have to say. But with the advent of some of the different social media tools that are out there, there are ways to be able to communicate with your staff, to be able to communicate with your community in the business official in, uh, in environment that are going to be okay. So not only do we have face-to-face -face or our website, but there's a, you know, Twitter is becoming a, a bigger and better tool for shooting out quick messages, getting information out there. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. And a blog, and I would say to you, you know, in the community that I'm superintendent, uh, we have, I would say, you know, 40,000 people probably um, somehow attached to our school community and our community at large. And every time I'll put out a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a blog post about what's happening out there, we get about 5,000 uh, page views within a couple of days, which says to me that people are, are looking for information and they want to be able to react to that information. So if I'm, if I'm a business administrator, if I got permission from my superintendent, maybe having a, a blog that talks about uh, maybe any building projects or things that are out there that, that the community would want to know. You know, are there going to be traffic delays due to construction equipment being in? Are there fields that aren't playable because of uh, environmental conditions? You know, all those kinds of things. You know, are, is there going to be um, is there a group coming in to look at asbestos for an upcoming project? You know, all the things that community members uh, clog your phone lines with. A lot of times, you can t take care of with a, a blog post. And then the next piece would be uh, Facebook. Facebook is one of those those deals. We started ours about a year and a half ago, and I was very skeptical because I was afraid it would become a free-for-all. Um, what I learned very, very quickly, though, is that a lot of our community members are attached to Facebook. In fact, they're, they're attached to Facebook probably more than they read email or text messages or anything else. It, it's, it's kind of a cult kind of thing, but um, you know, Facebook, for example, we started a page we had maybe five friends the first day. Well, by the end of the first six months, we had over a thousand uh, friends connected. So what we try to do is attach items that we have on our blog to our Facebook page. Now, again, if I was if I was a business administrator, you know, one of the things that I would use a Facebook page for would be, you know, in my old community of Hammondsport, we were right on a lake, and we used to have a gigantic uh, goose problem, as an example. Well, the goose problem became my problem because the geese were all over the, the playing fields and stuff like that. So our technology department and our buildings and grounds guy actually developed some decoys and patented them that were that were very, very successful in getting rid of geese. Had I had a Facebook page, I probably would have stated the problem to the community and, and I probably would have gotten solutions a lot faster because what I had to do at that time was use my school newsletter and the local paper to say in the beginning, here's our goose problem and we're looking for any suggestions on how to solve things. And I did get responses, but it probably took three months. Had I used Facebook, I probably would have, would have had some good suggestions in about three days, and I probably wouldn't have gotten um, as, many, as many negative phone calls and board meeting visits as, as I did from community members uh, trying to solve that problem. Then the next piece there is what I would say is Blackboard or any kind of site that allows you as a business administrator to be able to educate your staff or your community. So let's say, let's say for example, and don't mind the phone, please. Um, let's say, for example, you've changed some procedures or policies on something. Well, if you, you could actually hold a webinar, similar to what we're doing right now, for your staff, but you could use a product called Blackboard, and, and there are many other products that do it, uh, to allow you to be able to put documents up for staff to get a hold of, to, to be able to give instruction. Um, and one of the things that's nice about Blackboard as a communication tool, as, as a part of our social media project, is uh, you can track who's actually on, uh, on a Blackboard page, for example, and most of the other programs have the same thing. So, you know, for example, in my role as superintendent, um, I'm able to see how many board members actually have gone on to our page 
and grabbed the Board of Education documents for the board meeting. So I know that going into the meeting. But as a business administrator, again, maybe if I go back to the extracurricular example, if I was going to be changing policies or whatever on extracurricular um, activities, and I asked them to visit Blackboard to update the documents, get, get updated documents and maybe get some instruction, and somebody didn't, well, that puts you in the driver's seat when you have that conversation with them to, to ask them why they haven't met your requests. And then I, I know uh, Mr. Vespi, in a little while, is going to talk about uh, some things like uh, school alerts and all that, all that, and I'll, I'll leave that for him. But the school news notifier, which he'll discuss, is another example of ways that you can, you can leverage communication. Um, also, along with community communications, I, I think in your role as, if you're a business official or business administrator, and certainly in my role as superintendent, I think it is absolutely critical to have a close tie and, and close ties with your area media. When I first started as superintendent 11 years ago, um, and, and prior to that as business administrator and business official, what I found was that the reporters that were working for the various news agencies stayed with those news, news agencies. So it was quite, quite um, common to have the same reporter for five years in a row. Well, because the print media business is suffering so bad and um, other media is struggling as well, you're finding that reporters are kind of flipping over a lot more quickly. So what's, in, again, controlling the message, whoever is in the chair as far as the media goes, if you're able to establish uh, a good community connection with them and a close tie with them, you're probably going to be able to manipulate the news a little bit when it comes to their coverage of your stories. And, you know, some of the suggestions that I've got there, sending a press release is really probably the least effective way in terms of contacting your media people. Yes, it does control the message for, for sure, but I will say to you that, that a blog or Twitter or something on Facebook is usually, in my experience, has been picked up more quickly than an actual press release. And I also have noticed, and maybe this is just um, a sign of the times because these, these things are still new, that sometimes news outlets actually treat what you put on your blog or what you put on your website or on Facebook or on Twitter, they, they sometimes treat that more seriously than they will a press release. And I actually had a conversation with a former media person, uh, Kim Brown, who was at Channel 9 News in Syracuse, and uh, she went on to, to work someplace else, and I, I had a conversation with her about this whole media aspect, and her feeling from the reporter side of things was that when we were sending press releases about information, it was as if we were really trying to control the message, and anytime we sent a press release, if it wasn't something that was just a standard, you know, so-and-so won an award, um, that we were hiding something. So they were digging into our blogs, they were digging into the website, to try to find the real deal. And I learned a lot from that about uh, communicating with people. And I also think it's important, and, and again, in my conversation with her, calling them with news stories. It's, it's Even if something's not going well, it's always okay to call them ahead of time and say, hey, look, at, here's, here's what's happened. You know, we, we, had a, we had a bus driver incident today that I think you should know about. And that way, you can give them the, the facts of the story before, again, uh, the blogosphere gets going and, and you wind up with phone calls and rumors that you have to, to fix. Uh, the one pet peeve of any, anybody in the media is when you don't return a phone call. And I've learned that a couple of different times where I've, I've, I try to return. I'm a same-day service kind of person, whether it's via email, a text message, blog, however I get back to the media, I do. Uh, one, one situation, I, I had an emergency situation where I could not get back to a media outlet and they did write something that wasn't uh, wasn't good for the district, and it was not accurate because I couldn't get to them. So um, there's a two-way benefit to that. If if you give them the tools that you are using to communicate, uh, they will treat you fairly in challenging times. And, and I can I've had that happen time and time and time again, where something maybe not so great has happened in the school district, but because I've got a good relationship and they know that we've been very very open. And, uh, they've passed on it. And I, and I think in terms of being a business administrator or business official, if you're overseeing food service or maybe overseeing transportation, uh, buildings and grounds, that's where some of the, the nitpicky issues tend to come up. And a lot of your employees in those areas would love to take their case to the media. But if you have come up front 
and talk to the media ahead of time, or if the media calls you and you've been cooperative with them in the past, a lot of times they will they'll let it go, which which I've found as well, just in terms of again controlling the message. So always responding is, is really really um, important, and making sure that you recognize as a business administrator or superintendent that um, the media want to get the story. They know that a press release may not be the best way for them to get the information. They want the dirt. So if you can find a way to do it but still control the message, then you're probably coming out uh, ahead of the game. Uh, the one thing I will say before I go to the next slide is, is the role of your superintendent. So are the, if you are a business administrator, um, you, you know, you, you've got a boss. When I was in your role, uh, I, there's no way that I would have put a blog out. There's no way I would have started a Facebook page. And there's no way that I would tweet anything without the permission of my superintendent. And it is interesting just to mention that because, you know, in my college teaching, I teach a lot of classes about social media, but I also teach finance classes. So I end up having a lot of business administrators and budding business administrators in my graduate level courses. And it is very, very interesting, um, depending upon the school district, to hear, to hear someone that will say, well, I started this new initiative. And I'll say, well, you have your superintendent's permission, right? He's not going to care. She's not going to care. Well, we care. Um, it's not that we don't trust you or don't want you, don't want to do something, but as the chief executives of the organization, we really want to know what's going on all the time. So, if you are thinking about different ways to communicate with your staff, uh, and your superintendent is not communicating in these ways already, then you've got a couple of things to deal with. You've got to deal with how do you talk with your superintendent about allowing you to get your own messages out and all of that uh, without making them look like they are inferior to you. Because one of the things that, that you learn over time is that the people that, that communicate and control messages a lot of times are, are associated as people who are leaders because they've, they've got the message out there and are taking the district in a direction. So if you happen to have a superintendent that, that's not doing that or refuses to do that, you're probably going to have a difficult time getting their permission to do a website or a blog or, or something else because they're going to feel like the community uh, may not be supporting them as much as they will be supporting you when you're doing that. So just, just something to consider. Um, you know, some of the benefits of, of being, again, proactive, it's you need to become info-central. The, the, piece, the piece of the puzzle here about using social media is you want to be able to control everything. Um, with Twitter or Facebook or anything else, if you have a if you have a, a student who's maybe got has cancer and you're going to do a benefit, well, you can use that as the tool. However, if you have a situation where maybe there was a school bus accident and there's questions about you know whose fault it was or were their children injured and all that, you can still use these same vehicles to be able to get information out there. And then I got to tell you, if you make a mistake, if a mistake is made someplace, like let's say for example you're overseeing adult education as a business official and you brought you brought in an instructor that instructor did a poor job on a class and now you're getting some negative uh, feedback about things it I think it's very very okay once you you know get that situation under control to be able to say through your different media pieces um, something about you know look at we, we understand that there was an issue in this adult education class it, it's been fixed people have been refunded you know uh, please come back and, and take another class it gives you a chance to look at all sides of, of every single scenario. Now, here's here's something that it doesn't look very profound, but I think it kind of is in a way. This is called the quality triangle, and this this triangle has a very very long history. Uh, it, it dates all the way back to World War II, um, after after Japan was trying to re recover um, from their from the war, and when Toyota Motor Motor Company was was almost in absolute ruins after the war. They were trying to find ways to revive themselves and to get moving forward. And the, the, the people in charge were trying to figure out if employees weren't coming to work because they were dead from the war or if because they just figured that the business wasn't functioning anymore or they didn't want to work there or whatever. So they created this thing called, it, it's, today it's called the Quality Triangle, and you actually you'll see architects and home builders using it. Uh, I use it every single day. And it says this. If you take a look at the triangle, at the bottom it says quality. And 
I think all of us, all, all of us, want quality programs. Well, because resources are being diminished right now, um, resources and time become factors. And as business administrators, you may hear from your, your superintendent all the time, I need to have this done, this has to be done yesterday. Uh, you know, the gym floor has to be um, sanded down and redone in two days because basketball wants to use it. You have no other options. It has to be done this way, whatever you might get. If you look at this triangle, it, what the premise is, is that you can have any two of the three things that are in the triangle. And my doctor always asks me, he says, man, I, I cannot believe that your blood pressure is so good after all the stuff that you deal with. And I say, hey, look, it, it comes down to the quality triangle. And they what? And I say, well, look, it, it's quality resources or time. So, for example, um, you know, if I want to have a quality uh, website in a short amount of time, then I better not worry about how much it's going to cost. Because in order for me to get the, the resources there to be able to make it happen quickly, it's going to cost more than if we, if we do it in phases or something else. Um, if I want to have a quality reading program, reading series or reading program, and I don't have a lot of resources, then I have to understand that going into this initiative for a reading program, that it may take a year or two, and I've got to be patient. And knowing this triangle allows you to communicate to your staff, to your Board of Education, and to your community about why something may take longer than it's going to take. Because we're in a society now where everybody wants everything quickly, but they don't want it to cost a lot. And it, that just can't happen. And the more that I've taught this triangle, I actually took a portion of a board meeting to talk about it when I first started. This is how I operate. This is how the district operates with all of our initiatives. So, you know, we have a lot of quality triangles sitting out there. But if, if you were a project manager, you might have um, a spreadsheet that has the who, what, when, where, why. Well, you know, in our role sometimes we don't need all that. We need to know this. Okay, I need a quality I need a quality gym floor in two days so the basketball team can use it for a tournament. Well, okay, then, superintendent, then don't be surprised when you get stuck with uh, some massive overtime bills because i got to bring in six guys to be able to do this in, uh, in two days. That, that kind of thing has to happen. So just an important piece, I think, when you talk about communication and you're trying to control the message and get the word out there, recognizing what your limitations are and why and being able to explain that in a very calm way and having all of your ducks in a row a lot of times prevents uh, angry people from being at board meetings because people, people tend to get it when you explain it uh, in these terms. The communication flow is, is also a very, very important piece uh, as well. And I, you'll see this here. When I look at community involvement and I look at how people are, are getting a message, um, there, there's a low to high right there. So now I want you to think right now for a second. If you're a business administrator and you're communicating information out to your staff or maybe out to your community about different initiatives, you know, think about which method you're using. And, and I'm sure a lot of you are probably using newsletter website. Well, if we're using newsletter and website, you can't be surprised when large groups of people don't get the message. Because, um, as you know, if you were to go to your post office or any place that you deliver your newsletters, you're going to see uh, you know, hundreds of them in the garbage, certainly not read. And on the website, if the website isn't pushing information out to, out to your constituents or out to your people, and people have to go to the website to get information, uh, you're going to find that you won't have as much involvement. And when we start getting into the involvement uh, threshold, you have your blog and Facebook and email and Twitter. And you might ask, well, okay, so let's say I'm on Twitter and I tweet out a message that there's a water main break and that uh, you know whatever road is going to be closed for two or three hours. And you say to yourself, well, I only have, you know, in my case, I have seven, I think I have 730 followers on Twitter. I only have 730 followers. How is that going to get out to anybody else? Well, uh, you're spreading the message. So you've indicated that there's a water main break. Uh, via Twitter. Well, anybody who's received your message on Twitter is going to call their spouse, call their friend, text somebody, and let them know, hey, look out tonight, the bus is going to be late or whatever because the water main is broken. And then what your public relations person can do 
And if you're in a very small school and don't have a public relations person, um, whoever you have in charge of updating your website and that kind of thing can help to get that same tweet or message out via email, onto Facebook, and if you have a blog, you can include it there. And what I've found is that most people that are, are connected uh, to the blog or Facebook or Twitter have it being have that information being pushed to them. So if I make a blog update, they have it set up so that it gets pushed to them so that they know that there's a new message uh, waiting there. And then word of mouth uh, gets out. And the other piece, too, that I've noticed, especially with, with the blog and Twitter, um, all of the area media people are connected to both of those things. So when I put something out, I, I already know that the major news networks are checking things out. And that's why when you, when you look at, if you're familiar with our community at all, you may have noticed that when we had our wage freeze, it, we got it all done at like 6.30 at night, one night, but yet we were covered at 5 o'clock the next morning. That's because I put it on Twitter, and, and one of the local news organizations uh, decided to pick it up, and they put it on first thing on their, on their morning program, and that's how that ball kind of got rolling. So it's all about that, that, uh, that communication piece. If I was a business administrator today, I probably would have a Twitter account, and I would probably be using that uh, in conjunction with maybe my adult education person or my athletic director or others to be able to communicate about are there schedule changes, um, are there certain places people should park or shouldn't park, are there, um, you know, again, should somebody be alerted to a, a traffic condition? Uh, anything, that's with, anything that's under your, your purview would be good to get that information, uh, information out. And then here's the other piece, too. The, the pros and cons, because I've had a lot, a lot of people who have talked to me and said, there's no way I'm getting on Twitter, there's no way I'm blogging, and there's no way that I'm using Facebook because people feel that it's too costly, um, people feel that it's too time-consuming. And remember, just remember the quality triangle from a few slides ago. Um, some people will also say that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be that transparent. And, and I guess when I look at, at different things, you know, um, one of the things that, that we've been successful with is getting the message out and being transparent. And, I, and I've got to say, from my beginning days as a business official to today, you know, I started off with FOIL request after FOIL request because my superintendent would just would not give out information to the point now where I barely get a phone call for anything in terms of seeking information. And that has to do, I think, with the use of the social media. It definitely allows you to deliver quick messages. It allows you to be visible. It also allows people to feel involved in what's going on. And, and it gives you that raw transparency that so many people want today, and, and they want it because they're hearing from the government that we're not giving it. So they, uh, they want that. And when I talk to different superintendents and business officials or teachers, who really are resistant. I just talked to a superintendent today who is very resistant about using uh, Facebook, and this is a person who's also the business official in a very, very small school. You know, number one, I, I said, you know, look at Twitter. For me, I spend probably five minutes a day on Twitter. It's, it's got no cost associated with it. Uh, Facebook probably is about uh, ten minutes a day tops in terms of making sure that, that things are okay and, and what I want to be on there is on there. I probably spend, I'm going to say, maybe an hour a week on the blog because I want to make sure because, again, with the media being connected, a lot of times what I say in the blog is copied and pasted verbatim into newspaper articles. And I'm okay with that because it, it's my words getting into their article. Not a problem with that. Um, so and, th and that doesn't cost anything either. So. If anybody talks to you about cost, there is no cost to, to use these products. Um, there's, to me, for all of the hours that I know I work now, and when I was a business administrator, I worked pretty darn close to the same number of hours that I do now, um, an hour, hour and a half a week dedicated to my social media presence, to me, is just nothing compared to the benefits uh, that it's reaped over the years. You know, like I said, I, I can't tell you how many fewer phone calls I get about stuff because we use uh, social social media. Now with Twitter, you know, I will say a couple of things. Let's say you're a business administrator, your superintendent gives you permission, you, you start a Twitter account. 
if you're if you're like me, I'm kind of goofy. You know, after being a classroom teacher for a bunch of years and all that kind of thing, I like to use my sense of humor. I like I like people to know that I know what's going on. So sometimes I'll I'll send a picture or send a tweet from the pool boiler room. Sometimes I'll be you know on a football field. Sometimes I'll be in a cafeteria. It doesn't matter. I try to show up in different places all the time and send messages from there so that people get an idea that they understand what's happening in our school district. Well, you may not get quite that ability to do that like I have, but you certainly could, could tweet things from your cafeterias, if you make a cafeteria visit, from your bus garage, from maintenance buildings and grounds, things that are, are going on uh, like that. And I think what's important to remember if you choose to, to use Twitter is you just have to remember what your role is. If you're the business official, then you're the business official. You, you, can't, you can't put in your philosophy about the whole entire district if you're the business official. Um, if you're the superintendent, you can do that. And again, I've held both roles, so I, I understand the, the division there. Um, you also have to recognize that you need to filter yourself. So if, if you're gonna be using that as a tool, you've gotta recognize that a lot of people are gonna be able to read what you just put up there and any pictures or other things that you've got up there will probably show up someplace else. And that's perfectly okay. You just gotta remember that uh, people are out there reading your messages and will be waiting for, for information. Um, you know, the, the blog, and like I said, if I was still a business administrator, I would definitely have a blog because I would easily be able to tell people things about scheduling, uh, if we've had anything, anything that's required a long, a long term repair, I can talk about stuff in the bus garage. I can, I can just keep people abreast of what's happening under my umbrella. And that, what I think that does also is it gives a lot of validity to people that maybe uh, people in our communities take for granted, like our custodians, cleaners, food service workers. It'd be great to feature them uh, in your blog and some of the efforts that they're that they're doing and how they are helping their kids. It's it's definitely Definitely, uh, I use it to drive people to our website. You know, because like I said, a website you kind of have to go and grab it. However, if I'm using a blog, I can help funnel people to the website if they want more information about things. And I try to keep it as brief as possible. I've recognized through uh, the statistics tracking that my particular blog has that a lot of people are using their Blackberries or iPhones or iPads to to view the blog. So. Knowing that, I try to keep the message as brief as possible, so I try to update it at least once a week. And I also, and I try to give them information that they may not get in a newspaper or someplace else. I, I don't want to jip them by giving them something that they're going to see in the Post Standard or someplace else the next day. I try to give them something that's fresh. And I, I am always keeping in mind that whatever I write can be read or copied or used by anyone, for sure. And again, Facebook probably, I'll be very honest with you, Facebook was, was the last thing that I delved into because you know, I use Facebook personally. I understand you know, what happens on Facebook. I know that some people may make comments or do, do different things that may not be appropriate. So we really treaded lightly into Facebook about, I think, a year and a half ago. But since then, uh, people always ask me, you know, how many comments from, your po from the Facebook posts, how many comments have you had to remove in a year and a half? Half, and the answer is one. We've had to remove one comment because somebody uh, decided to drop an F-bomb in, in a comment. That's been the only time. And I've put some things up there. You know, our entire budget proposal link is up there, for example, a pretty heated topic right now. And that was handled uh, very, very well. And we use it with other, in partnership with other sites as well. And as long as you monitor the comments that are around there, I think you're going to be just fine. And again, it's another tool to drive people to your main communication tool, which is your website. And I guess just as an aside, from a financial perspective, I just mentioned to you that all these things don't cost anything. And the district for next year is actually moving away from uh, newsletters, which I believe uh, Faithful Manlius did uh, this year. We're moving, we're going to have three total uh, printed newsletters next year, uh, plus the budget edition for the things that we have to get out by law. And um, I'm not hearing any resistance whatsoever. I mean, people know where to get the information from. Uh, I went and talked to our senior citizen population. They get it. They understand it as well. And we're finding different ways to get that message out. So we're saving, I think it's 20,000 bucks next year by using social media. 
the Blackboard piece and the and library sites, that kind of thing, different ways for you as a business administrator to be able to get information out to other people. Um, just make sure that when if you start an initiative like this, that you keep things up to date. Um, one of the problems that we had here during the infancy of using Blackboard to get inf information out was we had our all of our board policies uh, in a much better searchable format out there for the community. While we have policy meetings four times a year to update policies, and some policies got updated, but we forgot to update what we had on Blackboard, and then we had a policy challenge because what was most current policy wasn't on the website and this that other thing, and that caused a little bit of uh, of anxiety and we fixed it. So we, we just learned that we have a, a three-step process to make sure that we keep things up to date on Blackboard. So three human beings are looking at the material that's there to make sure that it's, it's current. And also on Blackboard, this would be more for me than for you as a business administrator, just make sure that you're using your opt-out forms or if you're a district that uses an opt-in, just make sure that you've got those up to date because with so social media, you're going to find that your students are floating around the internet uh, a lot more frequently than they would be if they were only in the newspaper or in your school newsletter. And then make sure, again, that, that this is all connected to your website. So an example of this would be with our anti-bullying initiative, we did a, uh, a school district survey about bullying. Well, the results of that survey are available for our community. Um, through Blackboard, and we, we advertise that to our people through Twitter, through Facebook, and through the blog. And it's just funny to show you how old a newsletter is. The newsletter that just came out yesterday, it makes it sound like these results are brand new and you can just get to them, but if you were following Twitter and all that, you could have had this information about 25 days ago. So it just, just goes to show you, the, again, the, the pluses of, of social media. Um, interactive whiteboards, I'm just going to hit this very, very quickly because from a business administrator perspective, um, it's very, very easy to maximize aid through the use or through the purchase of interactive whiteboards, especially if you purchase them through BOCES to drive some aid for next year. But I would say to you, well, I have a slide that says, you know, natural learning environment, parallels New York State standards and all that. It's all very, very important in the from the classroom. What's, what would be important for you as a business administrator is if you ever hold any forums or if you hold any public meetings or if you hold any hearings or whatever it might be and you use an interactive whiteboard, you can record every single thing that you did. And then if you, have a, if you videoed the thing, a parent would be able to, again, use your website or other vehicle to go get that recording. If you decided to use your just a blog about what your hearing was, you could talk about that and then and then show them and have them download the recorded um, activities that you, you did on the interactive board. So just, just another way to, to do some things. Um, video conferencing as well, I would think as a business administrator, uh, you should be using more and more uh, opportunities to video conference. As a superintendent, uh, I'm doing a lot of point-to-point -point video conferencing, which keeps me in the building, which will which allows me to get my work done, uh, still get in the classrooms and, and stuff like that. It's a lot, as you know, it's a lot cheaper than, than us driving someplace to a conference or whatever, and it does allow you to control the message. Um, long time ago, I saw a presentation where a gentleman said that 11% of your intended message uh, gets to the gets to the receiver uh, via an email. Well, if you're able to use point-to-point -point video, whether it's a Skype or a Movi or or anything else that you might be using. Uh, the other person on the other end is able to see your facial expressions. You're able to use your voice inflection. Um, they can even sense your body language sometimes uh, via a video conference. And it is a great way to get your message across. And if you are talking about building projects or budgets or anything like that that's within your reach, um, doing some video conferencing isn't the worst idea in the world. And, it, and unfortunately, in the education world, it's fairly new, but if you're in the business sector, people have been using uh, video conferencing for a long time, and they, they completely understand why that would be a, a good tool to use. Um, some of the downfalls with the video conferencing is that uh, you are at the mercy of your bandwidth. So for example, um, I was asked by another BOCES 
to do a presentation for them this Friday for all their superintendents and, and Board of Education presidents on Friday. But it's, it's during the lunch hour. So I made sure today that we did a test run at noon to make sure that my own bandwidth at school wasn't being eaten up and so we'd be able to have a, a good conference on Friday. So sometimes you are at the mercy of that bandwidth. And then if, if you're doing a, a webinar or something like that where you're educating, sometimes uh, schedules don't match. But in a lot of cases, if you're just looking to go point to point to, to drive, to get something across, I think it works. Uh, another for example, you know, if you oversee technology as well, if, if uh, and you want to ask a question about a project or something like that, and your internal people have video cameras on their desktops and uh, the video camera that I use, for example, is a high-def video camera. It costs $60. The uh, Movi application that I use is free. And if I want to uh, tap in to find out what's going on, I'll actually video call my director of technology or my assistant superintendent. And then that way, I definitely have their attention when I'm calling them. And maybe you can do the same thing for your transportation director, your uh, director of buildings and grounds, your food service manager. Sometimes, uh, you know, them seeing you and you seeing them, if you can't get to them, is, has a lot more impact than a phone call. So, you know, in summary, I would say this. Nothing, there is, there's no substitute for um, having the right people for the job. And in your organizations, you are the right person for what you're doing, for sure. Uh, the different people that work for you and around you hopefully are the right people for the job. So as you, if you want to start getting into social media and branching things out, that, that would be what I would call a progressive vision. And what you want to have when you have a vision, you always want to have accountability. So if you're starting to talk with your superintendent about reaching out with Facebook or a blog or Twitter or, or whatever, you want to be able to give them a plan that talks about your vision for communicating more effectively within your area and then how you would hold that vision accountable. Um, you know, for me, it would be, I would say, you know, look at Mr. and Mrs. Superintendent, give me six months and let me see if the call volume decreases to my office about these key issues. You know, let, let's use that as, as a first level of accountability. Uh, and also, some of the things help you do some, some good fiscal planning. I mean, I really do feel strongly, you know, I'm superstitious about school budgets. Um, I don't sleep the night before the budget vote to this day, even though I've done 11 of them. Um, I really do think that if you use your social media tools and continue to communicate and get trust from your community through that communication, uh, I think that helps in your financial planning. You know, when you need something, your community is probably going to be there to hook you up. Uh, a critical component of doing any of this is proper training and follow through. So if you're going to say that you're going to do a blog once a week, for example, then you really have to do a blog once a week. Um, if you want other people to use, you know, video conferencing, for example, you got to provide them with some training so that both people, everybody knows how to do things. And then when you have different little successes, you have to celebrate those. You know, one of the things I think that we're getting away from with all the budget problems that we're experiencing is we, we don't celebrate. And, you know, we didn't cause the problems that we're facing today in our school budgets and everything else, but we are the ones who are working through the solutions. So. Every little thing that you do or your staff does together or you've communicated or someone's communicated to you, you've got to celebrate those and, and foster that team concept. And then once you've done that, go back to the quality triangle. So if we're talking about having a quality social media presence in, you know, in a short amount of time, it doesn't cost a lot. It's going to take your physical time just to get your mind wrapped around, this is what I want to do, here are the permissions that I need. You, you'll have that under control, and then just use that quality triangle for each additional initiative that you choose uh, to pursue. And it's really as simple as that. Um, some applications for the business office in particular, just in a, a kind of a final summary for me before I turn it over, would be, you know, your adult education schedules and payments. You know, I, I fought tooth and nail with our business office about accepting online payments, for example, for adult education. Well, by the time we got done doing that and using, again, using Facebook to advertise and, and all that and then accepting credit cards, uh, our adult education enrollment has, is more than double what it was before we took online payments. Um, that, that pesky extracurricular fund stuff, 
I would use some of these social media applications to educate, communicate, and hold people accountable through there. I think uh, my budget updating in terms of if there are changes in your budget, it's very, very um, critical to get the word out and being able to use social media tools for that is important. You know, obviously the old standby, having your board of education policies out there is, is helpful and directing people when there are policy changes through your Facebook or blog or, or however you want to do that. And then doing some quick education sessions. I mean, there are some other mandates and things that are happening that, re that are different from the way we used to do things. And being able to do maybe a quick education session over Blackboard or something like that would be helpful and quicker than trying to do something in a physical classroom, um, pulling people together, maybe paying them, stuff like that. And then also, I would be using it to update the public on the status of different initiatives. And again, that goes back to my, you know, when I was business administrator and a young superintendent, I used to think that everybody knew everything in terms of where our initiatives were and how things are going, but you'll find that the majority of your population does not know that. They may approve a building project, and unless you're building something that's right off a roadway, they don't know how the roofs are going. They don't know if the boilers are saving you money. You know, they don't know those things. And it's your job to let them know that and then celebrate, you know, for example, if you've if you've done an energy performance contract and because of that you're going to reduce your utility costs next year, well, if you communicate all of that via your social media pieces, then by the time they read it in the newsletter or see it in the budget, they're going to say, yeah, these guys are pretty smart. They put in new boilers and stuff like that and look at the kind of money they've, that they've saved. Um, just, just that kind of thing. And what I find results-wise is the transparency piece, and I, I do argue I do argue with different superintendents that there are a lot of superintendents out there still that just do not want to be transparent. They don't see the need for it. They, they think people will meddle. And I, I just could, I couldn't disagree more with that. I, I just think that uh, in this day and age, people are looking for transparency. Social media gives you an easy way to be transparent. It gives you the visibility. It gives you more time to do other work. And a lot of times, uh, you know, you get some great early ideas other people because you're interacting with people more than you are if you're just attending uh, a function. And I also think it brings about uh, improved collaboration. In this day and age, we need collaboration uh, more than ever, and the social media pieces, I think, really do that job very, very well. So um, with that, that's the end of my part of the presentation. Uh, are there any questions? If you have questions for Chris, please hit seven pound on your phone. have answered them all. At this point, we're going to turn it over to Mike Vespi. Hi, everyone. Mike Vespi, Assistant Superintendent for Business Services at the Fayetteville Manlius School District. And I have uh, Nancy Cole with me, who, uh, who's, who's able to, uh, to be with us for about another 10 minutes before she heads up to our high school uh, to do a story. She is our communication specialist from the Cap Region BOCES area. And uh, Nancy is a former reporter at the Syracuse Post Standard, and uh, she did a lot of head nodding as Dr. Brown uh, was talking about uh, media relations. So uh, you know, that was just an excellent, excellent uh, presentation, and, uh, and Nancy and, and I both concur with, uh, with a lot of uh, what's been discussed in terms of, of being transparent and open and honest and making sure that that, that story is communicated to the, to the media and having those relationships so that not only is it transparent, but it's very accurate. Um, I just wanted to expand a little bit uh, on the message and talk a little bit about what we've done at, uh, at FM. Uh, we are not um, in the same place that the West Genesee School District is at this point. Uh, we're considering pursuing um, some additional uh, social media applications. In fact, we had a conversation at our Board of Education Monday night uh, about Facebook, and uh, we're exploring that. Uh, as we have seen it uh, being used successfully in, in school districts like West Genesee and, and other school districts uh, throughout the state. Uh, but I, I did want to talk about where, we've, where we were and, and, and where, uh, you know, where we are now and, and how we got there. One of the things uh, that I'll be talking about is our, our website, uh, our use of email, uh, school news notifier, uh, which is uh, an email alert system. It's kind of our version right now of, of Twitter, although it, it certainly doesn't uh, work the same way. Um, 
talk about our Connect Ed communication system. Uh, that's our emergency communication system, and and, um, and then some other you know areas that we found to be very very helpful in terms of just small things uh, that weren't being done that we've implemented over the past year. Uh, items that we've added in terms of signage at our buildings, having informational meetings, and we've had a lot of success, uh, especially in our last capital project, uh, with creating video. So I'm going to start with uh, the website. First of all, on our website, we've, uh, in, in particular, I'll talk, you know, in, in terms of the business officials' perspective uh, and with regard to the budget, um, if you uh, have a chance to go to our, our website, um, you notice that we have a series of frequently asked questions. And uh, you know, as Dr. Brown alluded, um, I've been through a similar situation where everything's a FOIL request. And it's because the community doesn't understand where the information is or how to get it because it's never been posted there before. And I found that we, you know, as, as business officials, we know a lot of the frequently asked questions that stem around uh, budget terms, uh, you know, what's a reserve fund, you know, how's the tax rate established, et cetera. And so if you look on there, what we've tried to do is take the most basic budget uh, facts uh, and, and questions and turn those into frequently asked questions. And we keep an eye on that because every year it seems that we get more and more questions. We look at the question, uh, we review the question, you know, we try to make a determination whether it's it's just one person specifically or we think it can apply to everyone, and then we, you know, typically just put it right out there with, with an answer. Um, the other thing that we do is we link all of our news articles in one central location on our website. So, you know, right now, for example, if you were to go uh, to our website, we had a number of uh, media stories about what happened at our budget meeting Monday night. You'll find all of the links for all of those stories uh, right there, including video of of uh, both uh, our Channel 9 station and, and um, uh, YNN. So both of those are there. It's it's in one convenient place, and that will stay there throughout the duration. And then if, if for some reason those are timed out, et cetera, uh, we have the ability to capture them and keep them in that location. So it's all in one centralized location. I think the challenge, as Dr. Brown uh, uh, outlined, is increasing people's awareness of what's on the website. And, uh, and certainly now, um, you know, I think we've done a really nice job at, uh, at doing that. Uh, more, it's, it's being used, uh, you know, more and more. There are less questions at board meetings. There are less FOIL requests because folks know they can find the information right on our website. We also have a series of informational meetings, um, you know, in an effort to get out the, the, the message, get out the vote. Um, you know, and, and really the, the, the foundation, and, and it, it's, it's been very successful, is, is in our budget forums. And, um, you know, both of them were lightly attended from the standpoint of the number of, of folks that we have in our district, but the people that were there, are, we found our key communicators. And our message, we know our message uh, is getting out there. These are folks that, you know, might go to the local Panera and then tell 10 of their friends, and then it goes from there. And um, we, it's been very, very successful. Um, it's also worked to have meetings both during the day uh, for folks who are too busy at night and to have it uh, in the evening, and we found that to be really, really effective. Even on um, our day meeting was held uh, during an inclement weather day, and uh, we had great attendance and, gr and great media coverage uh, because the media was uh, not as busy during the day other than covering you know, stories about cars off the road. It happened to be one of our big snowstorms. But, uh, but we, did, we had a great turnout, and so, you know, we found that, that that was a tweak that we made this year that really drove folks to that informational meeting. School News Notifier, SNN, is an opt-in email alert system where you actually sign up, you know, similar to a, a Twitter concept. It doesn't have to just be district residents. It can be anybody. So you can be, you know, anywhere in the country and sign up and know what's going on at FM schools. And then all of our our news releases, any updates that we make to our budget, et cetera, all of that information gets sent out in that email for folks, you know, who have, uh, who want that immediate notification. And uh, we started uh, August 31st, 2009, and so far we've sent about 295 messages, and we're up to uh, 1,917 users. So, 
you know, again, that's open to uh, to anybody to sign up to see what's going on at the FM School District. And and I think as Dr. Brown mentioned, what you want to do is point those folks back to the information that you have on your website and make them aware. And and that's why, quite honestly, Facebook is such an exciting opportunity for us because anything we can do to point people back to get the accurate information is really what our communi you know our communication plan consists of. Um, you know, certainly we do a lot of staff e emails. You know, even within the staff, we we found. Uh, you know that our, even our own staff, who who might not be in tune with what's going on, were able to uh, get the message out consistently. And um, and uh, the other thing I'll add is is again, you know, all of this technology is great in the day and age that we live in. But uh, our superintendent and I go to every staff meeting and every stakeholder in the district, and we present the information. So recently at our capital project. So not only did we have the meetings with the community groups, not only did we have the meetings with, with all of the uh, HSA uh, and you know PTA type organizations, but we went to every single staff member and we asked them to communicate with us if they had questions, et cetera. And by including all those stakeholders, certainly it takes a lot of time. It's very it, it, you know very intensive, but uh, certainly I think uh, you know they're you know the most valuable uh, resource in getting that information out to staff. And uh, you know, there's there's been numerous times, and, and of course, as business officials, you've been involved with this. That you know, it, it just takes a, a rumor or some misinformation, you know, a week or two before the vote, despite your best efforts, uh, you know, to really cause some concern with that with that vote. And we find if we really get out to our staff and they see us and have a chance to interact with us, that 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 faith uh, and that trust. Uh, and that transparency just really uh, has a solid foundation and um, and really helps. Um, the print publications, you know, what I'd like to say that we have is, you know, we have a professional service now through Cap Region BOCES. And um, you know, I don't want to sound like an advertisement for that BOCES COSER, but they have a whole team of folks that have a variety of, of school districts in all different settings that deal with all different issues. And so, you know, it, it, in particular, uh, you know, this district just ha just got a, a a bus garage and a transportation office capital project approved, and uh, you know both of those buildings were the original to the district, so the district didn't have a real communication plan from you know that they could follow in the past. Well, through the service, you had people who have proposed a similar type project and and had some expertise in the area and did outline some of the potential questions and pitfalls. And so again, that collaborative ex uh, experience that we get by, by being part of the service is just outstanding. And so I think it's taken our print publications uh, to a whole nother level, whereas before we kind of had a, a graphic designer and you know we were all kind of in-house journalists. Uh, we've now outsourced that you know very efficiently to, to uh, a, a BOCES coaster you know that has a whole team of journalists. Uh, that, that really know how to get the message out, and they also know what the media is going to ask and follow up on. So I, I'd like to think that we've taken that to a whole different level. Um, the Board of Education, you know, trying to bring this down to more of a practical level and a different twist, you know, encouraged us to make up professional signs that go up right around the vote in front of every building uh, to, to just remind people, just a simple reminder. When we communicated with our stakeholders, a lot of folks said, look, we're out on the athletic fields. A lot of parents uh, said, we're out on the athletic fields. You know, we're in and out of buildings. You know, and, and just like Dr. Brown said, you know, a lot of those, those uh, print publications, unfortunately, find their way to, uh, you know, to the garbage before they're even read. Well, when you have a big, obvious sign that's out there in front of the building, and then the other thing that we do is on our sports fields, we made up the, uh, the, the small real estate signs that you would see in, or um, and you just stick them right in the ground, and those are great as well from the standpoint. On every field is covered at the point where every parent would walk out onto the field. So there's no question that you know our the folks, the, the community members that are attending those events, even the night of the event, will be reminded. Oh gosh, I've got to get down to uh, to get that vote out. And the last thing I'll talk about quickly is our, our video and. You know, again, when you look at uh, the modalities of, of how we learn and, and how we look at information, we created a five-minute video 
that outlined all of the deficiencies with our, our bus garage. So people could see the pictures, they could see the message, and, and they could understand, in our, our case, we're using uh, capital reserve funds so there's no tax impact, and you know that came up several times. Uh, I appeared in the video to talk about the finances. The bus mechanics appeared in the video to talk about the structural deficiencies along with the pictures about the bus garage. We had pictures of the elevator and the lockers that we're hoping to replace and of the boiler that had the 1952 sign on the original boiler. So there was no question. A number of folks came up to us and said, we watched the video. We couldn't believe that, uh, you know, that uh, the bus garage is in the shape that it is. We can't believe that the boilers are that old. And typically, you don't get that out of print. You don't get that out of word of mouth. But pictures tell a story like no other. And so, you know, and again, the video has to be, it has to be brief. Uh, it has to be something just like you see on a YouTube video where you click on it, you know, the, thing, the whole thing is, is less than five minutes so you don't take up folks' time, and your message has to be efficient. I also think it was effective that our Board of Education president uh, appeared on the video, and his message to the community was, we are in tough times, these are tough choices, we wouldn't bring this to you without this. And again, uh, you know, a, a Board of Education member, uh, someone who's in the community, who's well-respected, saying, you know, what could not be said in, in a brochure. Uh, so certainly that was, was very, very effective. At this point, um, you know, I'd be willing to take any questions, um, certainly follow up on anything, but I, I just wanted to, to, to echo a couple of things in terms of our, of our philosophy. First of all, I, I concur with Dr. Brown, the superintendent is the, um, is the chief spokesperson for the district. And so certainly in my role, I, always, I, I never return phone calls. I never discuss anything with the media uh, until I get Dr. Kaiser's permission. Um, secondly, our motto here is be the first and best source of information. We pick that up from our CAP region BOCES. And again, it's not that we want to control the message. We want to be open and honest and transparent. We want our community to trust us. We want them to know that they can count on us. And so that's why if we know there's a story that's, that's brewing out in our community, out in one of our buildings, uh, we know that there's a particular set of parents that are upset, we will do the story on our website first. And, and, and just like Dr. Brown mentioned, the media will then take the story that we put on our own website, including quotes from the superintendent uh, or anyone else who's involved, and that's what you'll see. And so, you know, I think in terms of that communication plan, you know, you have to be the, the, the first and best source of the information in an effort to really be open and honest and, and transparent. And so I, I would, you know, I would leave you with that, that, uh, that mess. There's nothing, there's nothing that we do uh, in public schools that should be secretive. Uh, we should be anticipating the questions. We should be sharing the information. We should be putting it out there so that the public really trusts what we have. And that represents a shift, I think, with all of us in terms of working in a public school district. And, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's good. It's a slow shift. And, and uh, some folks are, are farther along than others, you know, in the school community. But I think the more that we can do that, especially in these economic times, um, and especially with interactions with, uh, with public employees and government in general, I think this is probably one of the most valuable things that we can do to get budgets passed um, and, and get the support of our community is to be open, honest, transparent, and put the information out there, even if someone's not asking for it. And if it was something that you thought you would want to know, get it out there. Be the first and best source of information. On that uh, end note, I'd be glad to take any questions. If you have any questions for Mike or Chris, please hit seven pound on your phone. All right, Wendy and Deidre appear to be good. Thank you both for attending today's webinar. Mike, Chris, thank you for presenting. We appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Take care. Have a great day. Take care. The moderator has ended the conference.
Goodbye. Thank you for calling.